Okay, these are not uh, exaggerated figures or just for teaching purposes. These are real values with minimal deviations. That's why when you find your patients with uh, compromised values of these gases, it means there's a pathological conditions. Okay, it means there's a pathological conditions. So oxygen in the in the arteries should read 100 millimeters of mercury. These are very important. In hospitals, there is an instrument called the pulse oximeter. Pulse oximeter, very important. It can give you levels of uh, gases, especially oxygen, in the arteries. So if a patient comes with low levels of oxygen, you can, you can find ways of uh, helping. Okay. We'll talk about that later on. Now, in the tissue that is in the cells, the, the oxygen levels are 40 millimeters of mercury, but the carbon dioxide are 45 millimeters of mercury. Okay. That is in the tissue levels. In the veins, the veins, these are, they carry deoxygenated blood. That's why the partial pressure of oxygen is reduced. It is 40 to 40, uh, it's 40 millimeters of mercury, and that of carbon dioxide is 45 millimeters of mercury. Okay, it's just important to know these uh, differences. Okay, so because of these differences, gases are able to move from one compartment to the other through diffusion. And remember, diffusion is the process or it's a transport mechanism by which molecules move from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration. For example here, carbon dioxide in the cells is 45 millimeters of mercury. Okay. It's 45 millimeters of mercury inside the cell. But the arterial blood which is supplying the cell, the carbon dioxide is 40 millimeters of mercury. So there's a difference of five. So carbon dioxide easily moved from tissues into blood because of this partial pressure difference. Same applies, oxygen moves from the area of high concentration that is in the blood into the tissues. So these partial pressures are, are the mechanisms by which uh, gases are exchanged. Okay. Now, what are the phases of respiration? We won't waste much time here. That table was showing uh, everything. The respiration occurs in two phases. There's inspiration during which air enters the lungs from the atmosphere, and then there is expiration during which air leaves the lungs during normal breathing. Okay. So these are features that are observed. We are either inspiring or expiring. And inspiration requires energy. Expiration does not require energy. So inspiration is an active process where there is a contraction of the diaphragm. But expiration is a passive process where there is relaxation of the diaphragm passively. Okay, we'll look at those uh, mechanisms later on. So the other important thing is the functional anatomy of the respiratory tract. So it shows the path through which air moves. It enters through the nose. It passes through the pharynx. Passes through the through the larynx, the trachea, the right bronchus, and the lungs. Okay. Okay. Let's continue. I, I ended here. We're talking about functional anatomy of the respiratory system. We said that air enters through the nasal cavity, passes through the pharynx. Okay. Pharynx is just a common passage of, uh, of air and uh, food. It's just a common passage of air and food. And then from there, it enters the airways. Remember, it doesn't enter into the esophagus, okay? There is a, what we call epiglottis, okay? It prevents the entry of food particles into the airways. So, so for example, when you are swallowing, eh? 
there's a called the epiglottis. It prevents the food particles from entering to the airways. That's why when you look at uh, the mechanism of swallowing, there is a once you are swallowing, especially through the the pharyngeal stage, there's temporary cessation of breathing. Breathing stops for a period of time. Okay. So that's the pharynx. From the pharynx, there's the larynx. Larynx is also known as the voice box. Anatomically, you look at this later on. Okay, from the larynx enters the trachea. These are cartilage, uh, it has cartilage, tough materials called cartilage. Okay, from there it divides left and right, forming what you call the bron the bronchus, right primary bronchus, also called bronchi. Okay, from there the bronchus divides into the the bron uh, the bronchioles. I'm going to show you later on. Okay, so this table I just got it from uh, Totora. I know you. I hope you know Totora. It it summarizes the principal organs of the respiratory system and their function, starting from the nose all the way to the alveoli, the lungs, and the pleura. So just find time to pass through these very important uh, uh, notes. For example, randomly, alveoli, what's the function? It's the main site of gas exchange. Okay. When you go again, pharynx, what's the major function? A passageway of air and food. Okay. So these are some of the important structures of the respiratory system. And then there's this concept which I wanted to mention, the visceral and uh, pareto pleura. So this lung, okay, this is this lung, uh, is enclosed within this pleura. There's what you call the visceral pleura and the pareto pleura. Now, each lung is enclosed by a bilayered serous membrane called the pleura or the pleural sac. Okay. The pleura has two layers, namely the inner visceral and the outer parietal. So at the outer side, that's called the parietal pleura. And the, that sac near the lung, it's called the visceral pleura. So they form a space here. That space is called the, the, the pleural space. Okay. It's called the pleural space. Even when you were looking at the cardiovascular system, you, you saw that the heart is within the pericardial, uh, it's surrounded by a space. Okay. There's called the pericardial cavity. So even these lungs there, there's a space. They are surrounded with a fluid called the pleural, uh, fluid okay so the visceral layer is uh, attached firmly to the surface of the lungs at the helum it is continuous with the pareto layer which is attached to the to the to the walls of the thoracic uh, cavity okay but it's also important to know that the pressure in this called the intrapleural pressure it is sub-atmospheric. That is, it has a suctioning. Okay, it's it's a negative pressure. Okay, we'll look at that later on. It's a negative pressure, such that if there's an external puncture, for example, you uh, somebody uh, stabs you with a knife. So when the when the the pleural space has been exposed. Air enters through the pleural space. Okay, we call that a pneumothorax. And it's, it bulges. Okay, we'll talk about that. So that's what we mean by uh, negative uh, pressure. Now, the function of the intrapleural fluid, it's very important. It functions as a lubricant to prevent friction between two layers of the pleura. 
okay and it is also involved in creating the negative pressure called the interpleural pressure within the uh, the intrapleural you're going to see that the intrapleural pressure it prevents the the lungs from collapsing very important it prevents the lungs from collapsing because naturally the lungs have the tendency to collapse okay the tendency to collapse because they are made up of elastic tissue so they have a tendency to collapse so intrapleural pressure together with the surfactants which we are going to talk about later which are produced by the type 2 pneumocytes uh, when you when you examine histologically the structure of the of the single alveolus you are going to see there are type 2 pneumocytes so the intrapleural pressure together with the surfactants they prevent the lungs from uh, collapsing okay so just to talk a bit about this same intrapleural pressure uh, if you see this diagram this is the right lung this is the left lung there we have the diaphragm so we say the the layer just closer to the lung itself to the lung parenchyma tissue it's called the the visceral pleura okay where is it um, the visceral pleura and the okay it cannot be it's not shown here but the the, the other layer or the stack away from the lungs which is attached to the thoracic wall it's called the the parietal pleura so this this space is called the pleural sac okay so when we when we look at the pressures here the pressures in the lungs is called the intraalveolar pressure intraalveolar pressure so when we say what is the intraalveolar pressure we are talking about the pressure okay of air in the lungs it's 70, 760 millimeters of mercury okay which is uh, which is the same at rest okay which is the same uh, with the atmospheric pressure so in the atmosphere the pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury what is pressure by the way hmm? if you remember pressure it's not a very complicated term terminology we're just looking at the force acting per unit area okay we're looking at the force acting per unit area pressure we are looking at the density the concentration okay the weight all those the, all those are related to pressure okay so the density the concentration of uh, of air in the lungs it's about seven, 760 millimeters of mercury okay which we can also call it zero millimeters of mercury relative to the atmosphere that is when the the lung is at rest because remember when the person is breathing we have two uh, we have three cycles there's inspiration a temporary stoppage which is called rest and then expiration a temporary stoppage which is rest and then back to inspiration okay so at a particular moment when the person is at rest the pressure here it's about 760 relative to the atmosphere so it is zero now what about the pressure inside that intrapleural space okay the space which is covered by the parietal pleural and the uh, visceral pleura the pressure is 756 millimeter which is negative 40 which is negative 4 millimeters of mercury okay we are just saying the uh, the negative why are we calling it the negative because it's uh it's it's a pull it's a pressure that pulls okay this is a pressure that pushes the intraalveolar is a pressure that pushes but this is a pressure that pulls things to itself okay normally when you for example in life when you are under pressure it means there's a force pulling on you but when you are when you have a negative pressure it means it's you actually who's pushing or pulling 
pushing against things. Okay, it's just an uh, analogy. But what we are trying to say, this pressure, it pushes. But this pressure, it pulls. So that's why I said in the beginning that any opening here will, will cause air to move into the intrapleural, into the intrapleural pressure. Okay, so when we get a segment, okay, before we, we look at that, there's this also, this other concept called 